Good morning. Good morning, President. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Very glad Thank to see you. you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to address your audience. Um, should we go straight to the questions? Yes, as you wish. Mr. President, a year ago the war in Nagorno-Karabakh started and you regained control over most of the territory. Uh, in November you told me that after the war you will be willing to sit down or return to the negotiation table. Are you now ready to sit down directly with Mr. Pashinyan, the Minister Pashinyan, and if yes, when and in what form? Yes, as I said you last time, uh, we are ready. And actually, the uh, talks and the contacts have started. There is a format of cooperation on the level of deputy prime ministers of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia. And this format uh, is dedicated to the issues related to the opening of communications. Also, recently, uh, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly session, foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan met. That was for the first time since uh, the war ended. And I think that the meeting, as far as I was informed by our minister, was very constructive and promising. Uh, our position remains uh, unchanged since the war ended. We want to establish normal relations with Armenia based on a mutual recognition of territorial integrity of both countries. We are ready uh, to start immediately the process of uh, delimitation of uh, our borders. And of course, after that process is ended, demarcation. And also, we also express willingness to start uh, to work together with Armenia on the future peace agreement. All these uh, initiatives have been articulated on many times by me and by other Azerbaijan officials. But unfortunately, I have not been yet positively responded by the Armenian side. So our position is unchanged, and uh, there is a certain steps, but I think during this year we could have made much bigger progress. But so you don't have any uh, intention to sit down today with Prime Minister Ashinian? Uh, I'm ready, and I already expressed uh, this position. If Armenian side is ready, I'm also ready. We had uh, one meeting that was in trilateral format uh, at the invitation of the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, in the beginning of this year. And I'm ready to, uh, to talk to Mr. Pashinyan any time when he is ready. So I'm open for the discussions, and I think that could be also a good indicator that the war is over and that page have been turned down. This is very important because still we see and we hear in Armenia, in political establishment, the statements uh, which uh, demonstrate the attempts of revanchism, the attempts of uh, future plans to regain back uh, territory which belongs to us by history and by international law. Therefore, uh, the willingness of Armenian government, the serious willingness, not only words, but statements, but actions, uh, will demonstrate that the war is over and we are moving towards the period of peace. But for, the, for Armenia, there is still the question of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. And in the past, you offered possibilities like cultural autonomy. Is that still an option or is it off the table? Frankly speaking, uh, during the last uh, period, we do not hear from Armenia any uh, statement referring to the status of uh, that territory. Unfortunately, these uh, ideas are articulated by some other countries, their high representatives. As far as our position is concerned, I expressed it on many occasions during the almost 30 years of negotiations, Azerbaijan's position was very constructive. And we were saying, and uh, means group coaches know it very well, that we were ready to grant uh, Armenians living in Azerbaijan certain level 
of self-governance. But this position was uh, always rejected by Armenia, and they were always demanding independence for what they called Nagorno-Karabakh. But today, after war ended, and the conflict has been resolved, and this is not only my position, this is position of the uh, majority of uh, world international community, there is no room to talk about any status for the so-called entity which does not exist. Because Nagorno-Karabakh do not exist. We do not have uh, this administrative unit on our territory. Uh, on 7th July this year, I issued a decree about the new configuration of economic zones of Azerbaijan, and we've created two economic zones, Karabakh and uh, uh, Eastern Zangizur economic zones, which cover all the area. And about 25,000 of ethnic Armenians who live today in Karabakh area, in the area which is now uh, in the responsibility of Russian peacekeepers, are our citizens. They will enjoy the same rights and privileges and responsibility as any other citizen of Azerbaijan of different uh, religious and uh, ethnic origin. So to put it shortly, no way to go back to status, no status, and everybody should forget this issue. Okay. Um, there is a lot of other issues to discuss, like you said, the delimitation of borders, uh, prisoner swaps, demining. How is this going? Is it going forward or is it stopped? With respect to so-called prisoners of war, I want uh, to clarify this issue for your audience. I, on many occasions, referred to international law norms, international conventions about who can be considered a prisoner of war. And according to international uh, conventions, those persons who have been detained or captured during the uh, war, during the face of war. And those persons whom we detained during the war, all of them have been returned immediately after the war ended. We actually returned them earlier than Armenians returned our prisoners. Those people who are now in detention and already sentenced, uh, whom Armenia and some others claim as prisoners of war, do not belong to this category because these people have been uh, sent to liberated territories in the end of November, uh, more than two weeks after the war ended, more than two weeks after Armenia signed a capitulation act, and they have been detained on the territory which we liberated in the beginning of December. 62 persons, and some of them committed crimes. They attacked our military servicemen and killed four of them. And uh, uh, so they are not uh, prisoners of war. They're terrorists, they're members of a sabotage group who've been sent in order to uh, attack Azerbaijani civilians and military service. Despite of that, we have returned uh, some of them during this uh, period. And uh, uh, that uh, was a sign of goodwill. But with respect to the uh, maps of mines which have been planted by Armenia in the territories which were under occupation, and there are hundreds of thousands of mines, in the beginning, when we were demanding to give us these maps, Armenian government on the very high level was saying that they do not have it. And uh, during the time since uh, a war ended, during this almost one year, we had uh, close to 150 casualties of civilians and military servicemen who either were killed or seriously injured uh, due to the fact that Armenians do not give us the maps. Some maps have been given uh, relatively recently, but the accuracy of those maps is only 25 percent. So what we are demanding uh, is that Armenia gives us uh, accurate maps, the maps which can be uh, easily identified, not the area where they are planted, they are planted everywhere, but particular uh, place. And they have this uh, you know, particular information which they refuse to give us. If they do it, if they show the goodwill, of course, we will respond adequately. 
Uh, the group Minsk of uh, OCE is mediating, but others are offered also their help, like the European Union, for example, in the mining or the limitation of the border. Um, it, is, it, is it an option for you that the EU has a role in the post-war conflict? Yes, yes we, uh, we support this initiative, and actually it has been discussed during the numerous contacts between our officials and EU officials and also during the visit of the President of European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, to Azerbaijan this summer, we broadly discussed post-war situation and expressed our joint uh, willingness to engage actively. EU has a very big experience in different areas, in the areas of reconstruction, in the areas of, uh, you know, creation of the peaceful environment. Uh, therefore, EU expressed its willingness to participate in the process of delimitation to help both sides to come to an agreement, and we support this initiative. But as far as I know, Armenia is hesitant. Armenia uh, did not uh, decide whether they will accept the EU's proposal or not, but Azerbaijan's position is very open. We are ready to work, and actually, on different levels of uh, our officials, we are in permanent contact with EU. EU can help us in delimitation. EU can help us in uh, opening of communications, and also uh, post-war development. And uh, also, we've been discussing with EU the issue of uh, economic assistance. We heard and we know that EU have uh, prepared or is in the process of uh, preparing the economic uh, recovery package for Armenia worth 2.6 billion euros. And of course, we expect that the same amount of money will be offered to Azerbaijan on the same terms and conditions. Whether it's grants, whether it's loans, it should be equal because uh, we as a country which suffered, we have 10,000 square kilometers of totally destroyed territory, all the cities, hundreds of cities and villages. Therefore, we, uh, of course, expressed our concern that this uh, economic recovery package can be unbalanced. And uh, we are now in the process of uh, communications with EU and expecting from them the proposal for us for economic support. So EU can do a lot, and we're ready to use this opportunity, and uh, we trust EU as an honest broker. When do you expect that uh, the civil population can go back to the liberated territories? First uh, 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 obstacle, of course, is the mines, because uh, without demining, we cannot return uh, civilians, because we cannot put their life under threat. Therefore, as I said many times, our main, uh, main rival, if I may say so, is time. Uh, so we are doing the mining ourselves. We've uh, increased the number of deminers in our national demining agency. Also, we increased the number of military servicemen who also are involved in this process. But it takes time. But despite, in those areas where we already made the mining, we uh, already started to build uh, settlements, uh, cities and villages for civilians. First, what we've done, we've done a full survey of the infrastructure demands and electric power infrastructure fully will be ready by the end of this year, in a couple of months. Also, issues related to roads and uh, water supply are important. And we already started several months ago investments in one pilot village, which uh, will be ready to receive first uh, settlers, maybe by the end of this year, beginning of next year. So this is the process already in the pipeline. We are preparing the master plans for all the cities and later for the villages. And we've allocated for this year only 1.3 billion uh, US dollars for reconstruction of uh, uh, liberated areas. So it's difficult to say 
in exact uh, you know, time when uh, it will start, but it will start in stages. And the first stage, as I said, will take place in several months. And during the war, you had the support of Turkey and Russia acted as facilitator for the ceasefire and as peacekeepers. Um, do you think the war has changed the balance of power in the region? Yes, Turkey uh, supported us from the very beginning and we are very grateful to the Turkish government for political and moral support they expressed from the first days of war. And uh, now, after the war is over, Turkey is playing a very important role in uh, future regional development and regional uh, stability in the region, as well as Russia. And as you probably know, uh, Russia and Turkey uh, have a joint monitoring center in the district of Agdam in Karabakh uh, region. And at the same time, Russian peacekeepers are uh, providing peacekeeper operations in the area which uh, is inhabited by Armenian population. Uh, so uh, new realities uh, already are uh, in place. Every country has to take into account these realities. The balance of powers between Azerbaijan and Armenia have been changed many years ago. We knew our potential, we knew Armenian potential. Probably Armenian government could not realistically evaluate that uh, they have no chances in front of Azerbaijan. And if they do not liberate the territories peacefully, they will have serious complications. And today, um, I think uh, uh, Turkey and Russia, as two neighbors of Azerbaijan, uh, and one of them is a neighbor of uh, Armenia, uh, play a very important role in the stability, security, and future development. That, as you probably know, there was recently a meeting between presidents of two countries. Among other issues, they discussed the situation uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And we consider the uh, role of both countries as a very positive, a stabilizing role. And I think this is the bulk of the new regional cooperation configuration. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. We see the possibility of active regional cooperation with the three um, South Caucasus states and the three neighbors, Turkey, Russia, and Iran. Yes, we supported uh, the proposal of Turkish president of this uh, regional cooperation platform, Free Plus Free. Armenia did not respond yet. You see, again, unconstructive position of Armenia, but we fully support that. And that will be very important for uh, not only post-war settlement, but in general for uh, regional development uh, in our area. Because if we will be able to manage to create this uh, format of cooperation between six countries of the region, that will be the main uh, guarantee against any kind of uh, new uh, hostility. That will be an important factor for regional cooperation, and uh, it will generate a lot of benefits. Only due to the opening of communications, which Azerbaijan strongly advocates for, we can immediately increase the trade turnover between countries of the region. We can uh, create uh, maybe 10,000 of new jobs only by the opening of communication. But if we enhance mutual trade, if we concentrate on positive dynamics, uh, our region will transform from the region of tensions to the region of stability and peace. Mm -hmm. My last question, uh, speaking of cooperation, you started, Azerbaijan started at the end of last year um, sending flying gas to the south of Europe. And have them in the European gas market. The storage levels are low and the price is soaring. Um, do you see any potential in this situation to increase export and how much gas do you all send to Europe? Well, you are right. We started uh, our export to natural gas to Europe on the last day of the last year, 31st December. And since that time, the uh, profile of our export is growing. Uh, we are a reliable supplier of oil to European market for many years, for uh, 15 years. 
without any disruption. And now, as a reliable supplier of natural gas, we play our role. Our gas is cheaper than gas from different sources, and it comes uh, from a new source. Importance of Southern Gas Corridor is not only uh, because of its uh, additional gas, but because it's an uh, alternative source. And this is an issue of energy security. Uh, our gas, which we are uh, sending to European consumers, have been contracted already. We sold it. Therefore, if there'll be additional demand from European consumers, we need to start negotiations because first you have to sell the gas and then you have to extract it. In the gas business, it's the common, uh, how to say, consequence of, uh, of actions. And the deposits of uh, proven reserve of uh, natural gas in Azerbaijan are 2.6 trillion cubic meters. So it will be enough at least for 100 years for our consumption and for uh, exports. And we are now in the face of new discoveries. The interest to Azerbaijani oil and gas sector among the big energy companies is growing. So we can increase the output uh, and increase the production. But for that, we need to start negotiations now and sign new contracts. And then we will invest to produce more. But that's not possible for this winter, I think, right? Uh, it is not possible technically and commercially. Just It's just one, two months left. But if we start uh, now, I think uh, we will be ready for the next winter. And there is a potential to increase. Plus, we are now actively investing ourselves and foreign investors into renewable energy. Therefore, uh, we will have more uh, of uh, natural gas which we consume ourselves for export because we will substitute it with uh, uh, sun and uh, wind energy. So, uh, as I said, potential here is very big. Pipeline is in operation. Uh, we, in the future, may expand our geography of supplies to Europe, to Balkans, to some other countries of Eastern Europe. And that will be good for consumers, for us, for companies, for everyone, for energy security. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank I you. Really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.